This is the building that I mentioned. This is the reconstructed uh, building. In the center, it was a greenhouse on the other side and then workshops on this side. The slave quarters were in the one-story wing that you see going out from either side you know, of, that, of that central bay. And we have one of those spaces is now interpreted uh, as a slave quarter. The other three are, are right now do, serving other purposes. One is a, a museum where we have some, ex, uh, some exhibits that we'll go in and take a, take a look at in a minute. One's a museum shop, and one's just a behind-the-scenes functional area. As time goes on, we have plans to return more of these spaces to active interpretation so that uh, as, we, as we are able to move some of these modern functions into other places, then we'll be able to do this. And that's the long-term goal of the entire association, is that over the last decades, uh, we have uh, sort of uh, you know, sequentially moved modern intrusions out of the exhibition area so that we can return it to, to its interpretation. OK, I think that I don't see many people in there. Let's quick like bunnies. Uh, actually, the, the slave quarter was outfitted as an interpretive space in 1951. It did not open to the public until 1962. Hmm. Why is that? Because there were all sorts, and the memos on this are great. Uh, if you go to the library and look up the files, you've got all these memos going back and forth between staff people and the, and the board of directors. There, there were all these issues on how to interpret this space. And the, the, the issues start very, very basically, which is, you know, what was this space like? How was it used? There's, there's very little information about how these rooms were divided and how, how, the, how people actually used them. Uh, we know that there were large rooms like this because of the archaeology that, that, that showed the partitions and the foundation walls. Plus, we have George Washington's plan of this building when he made the additions onto it in 1792. And it shows four large rooms, like this one, with a single doorway on one wall. And, that, and that's basically it. Um, we know that the slaves living here, as I said before, were craftspeople and servants, etc. Now, not all of the 90 slaves living at the Mansion House Farm were living here. We know that a fair number of them lived in some of the other outbuildings. The blacksmiths, for example, lived above the blacksmith shop. The cook lived above the kitchen, you know, that kind of thing. So not all 90 people lived here, but certainly a, a fairly high percentage of them would have lived in these spaces. Now, as I said, how was it configured? How was it used? Frankly, you know, this is still just sort of our best guess. Now, one of the real issues was, was this over here, these, these beds. Uh, one of the few documentary records that relate to this building, to the construction of it, are to nailing up the berths, B-I-R-T-H-S. Nailing up the berths and putting uh, brick foundations for the berths. And it seemed pretty clear that these were beds of some sort. But what does that mean? You know, what's a berth? You know, and so again, there's these great memos where people go through. The OED says a birth is blah, blah, blah. In the Navy, a birth is this. And the Army's a birth in this. And Scotland, they, this is a birth. You know, so there was all this sort of, you know, attempts to figure out what all that meant. Well, this is what they came up with, you know, kind of this bunk bed, you know, arrangement. Now, why is that important? Well, it, it relates to sort of the whole thing here. If it's bunk beds, they, you know, that implies sort of a barracks type of situation. Now, this is an unusual building for the 1790s in Virginia. Large barrack-style slave quarters with large rooms like this where lots of people were kept together in this situation was very much more typical in the early 18th century than the late 18th century. Um, and in fact, at the outlying farms, of course, it was not this situation. At the outlying farms, the slaves were living in uh, log cabins uh, where you know, probably a couple of families could stay or, you know, multiple individuals or whatever, but much smaller numbers. And so it's very interesting, one, one point about this is it's very interesting why Washington went, went to this and why he designed a building like this. Again, it's very much a throwback to an earlier method, you know, of, of housing slaves. Uh, we also had things like some people said, we can't open this building because General Washington would, wouldn't possibly have done this to his slaves. He wouldn't make them stay in this kind of a situation. You know, what is this telling us about her? So there were all these concerns back and forth about, you know, whether we're doing the right thing because we're giving the right interpretation and the implications that those may have 
on George Washington and all this kind of stuff. So the bottom line was that the building did not open for 10 years. Um, the lesson here is that time passes, tempers cool, people move on, and 10 years later, you know, they revisited it and they in fact, you know, did open it up and interpret the space. Not exactly like this, but similar to this. Now what's happened over the years is that with more research, for example, when I came here 15 years ago, there were quilts on this bed, on these beds. And they weren't straw, wasn't straw there, they were, they were, they were mattresses. I mean, they, they weren't real comfortable mattresses, but they were mattresses. Anyway, and so what's happened over the years is, you know, as time, you know, as time passes and as, as we get a little bit more sophisticated, uh, you know, in our understanding of this, that they have made changes to this interpretation. Some of this is based on archaeology. We excavated near here, uh, and I'll talk more about that, uh, about the findings there. But some of the actual utensils and things you see here are based on the archaeological research and then other documentary research that's been done. Now, I should add as well that, that we are very fortunate in that the records uh, here are, are, are significant and that Mount Vernon is probably one of the best documented plantations, 18th century plantations, in the country. And the documentation on the slaves living here is, is, is equally remarkable. Now having said that, you know, that means we have a lot of information, but we don't have everything. So there's enormous areas where we're still left to trying to figure things out based on what's happening somewhere else or, you know, what we can infer and all that. So uh, we are very fortunate in that most of the interpretation that we're able to do here is, is very, very heavily based on specific information here at Mount Vernon. This is an example where, you know, that even that good information, you know, fell short. Of course, m most sites would be very happy to have any information on their slave quarter. You know, we're unhappy that we don't have enough information to be, you know, to be completely confident about, about everything in here. Any questions at this stage before yes. I let, let you set you from yes. dying yes. here? Yes. This is the original floor. It is not the original floor. The reason I ask mm -hmm. that, and um, the Sanfi and some officer on South Carolina, uh -huh. when they cleared it off, they had a floor just like this. Is that right? That's great. So that's what I thought it was an original floor. Right. It's not an original floor, but we do know that there was a brick floor in here. The records do indicate that. Um, but it's, it's not the original floor. Okay, any other questions? What about the windows? Were they? Uh, you know, <laughs> were they no, sure? yeah, are you sure that they were in, in the original building? Uh, actually, we are. We are. Uh, one of the things that we do have, we have a painting from 1792 that shows this building from this side. And then we have several early 19th century insurance records that show, uh, that, and they included drawings of all the buildings here. And so in 1951, when they reconstructed this building, that was at that point that they felt for the first time confident enough to do it because they've been talking about it for a long time prior to that. And one of the reasons was that they had just found these insurance documents. And in fact, they do show windows running on the back side. Um, and all those drawings and the paintings show the single doorways and windows on the front side of the building. Okay. Can you tell us about the paint job? The paint job, or the lack of paint job. Well, yeah, I mean, it was it artfully designed to look like an old, uh, what, or, or is this a result of I think it's changes? It, and yeah, it's the result of being here for 50 years. This is kind of a moist building. They basically, you know, initially they, they, they painted the interior as if it was whitewashed. And we, we know that in fact, we don't know, I don't know precisely that it was done here, but it was certainly something that was, that was quite often done, was to whitewash the interiors of buildings, of living spaces, uh, not only just slave quarters. So they did that, and what's happened over time is that this is a, a very moist wall back here, um, and so we've lost paint because of What about that black, is that paint, or is that just the color of the... Well, I think that that was something that was underneath the paint that may have been some sort of an attempt as a barrier, you know, as a moisture barrier, and it, it failed, and then, you know, it's off. And one last question was, a, I guess a bump must have been removed at some point? Yeah, uh, I don't know exactly why, but clearly, you know, when they first installed this, they probably had another, another section of bunks, and they took it out. Uh, I can only assume that they took it out because they wanted additional space you know, to put more domestic furnishings. One to bed? Pardon me? Yeah. One to bed? We don't know. It's like a women's party. We do not know. I mean, it's about the size of each other. That's a horn. That's an animal horn. And they were oftentimes used for, you know, for storage things. Well, thank you very much.
about a truck that was 90 degrees, 90 degrees humidity as it usually 